Hello, gardeners. We're glad that you've joined us. This is Mid-American Gardener, and we're here with a great panel of experts, and we're going to address some of your questions either by phone, email, video. We're here to talk about gardening. I'm Diane Nolan, and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Science Department, College of Aces, but I've got three really talented people here, so let's find out who they are. If you can direct your phones, it, it, when you call, if you can direct your question towards their expertise, that makes it so great. All right, let's start first with Dr. Bob Skirvin. Hello, Bob. Hello, Hello. I'm Bob Skirvin. I teach beginning horticulture at the University of Illinois, and I also teach fruit crops, small fruit crops, especially blackberries, raspberries, things like that. Anyway, so uh, what I have a show and tell I want to show you today, that uh, one of the things that maybe you've seen in the grocery stores is there's all sorts of new products coming in. And one thing they've decided that people will eat their food more if it's chocolate coated. <laughs> and, 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 and it's true. You know. And so anyway, so one of the things that I've always thought was funny was prunes. Now prunes, I, I like prunes myself, but most people have this idea that prunes are for constipated old people. <laughs> and, uh, and they're not, not for the youth. And so uh, several years ago, you may remember there was a, there was a program to read the name instead of calling them prunes, they're going to call them dried plums and try to change the name. It didn't really work very well. And if you go to the store now, you'll see that sometimes they're, it, both names are on the package. Anyway, this is another product here. This is a product that's in the grocery store right now that uh, I, I own no, no stock of this company at all. <laughs> I just bought the package so we could try it. I haven't tried them either. And these are chocolate covered, and they, they call them dried plums here. So they're prunes, they're chocolate covered. And so you can get your, the health benefits of the, of the prunes here with your chocolate too. With the health benefits of chocolate. With the health benefits of chocolate. <laughs> and they're, they're really, in addition to being a, kind of like a joke, it really is good. <laughs> they taste pretty good. You know, tastes like chocolate. <laughs> tastes like it has like chocolate covered raisins. You know, you've seen them. They have chocolate covered pomegranates and chocolate covered cran cranberries and chocolate covered plums. They're yeah, pretty good. Anyway, so. They're good for you. You don't get fat on them, but they're good. They're health benefits. Bob, we can always count on you. That's good. And we told him he was passing that around after the show. Right. Okay. Thank you, we'll, Bob. We'll leave those. And then in the middle is Teresa Mears. Hi there. Um, Teresa Mears. I'm an instructor out at Parkland College. I teach in the horticulture area, uh, greenhouse, plant ID, some turf management, and uh, pest management stuff. So a little round mm -hmm. background. I have a question though from a viewer in Mattoon. Deborah likes succulents and she's having a hard time overwintering them. She has them in the pots, puts them outside, no luck. Um, not all succulents are created equal. Some are a lot more difficult to overwinter in a container than they are to overwinter outdoors, even though they're more of a tropical plant sometimes. Um, they really, really need good, good drainage to live through the winter and I have um, an owl plant at my house that I don't think I water but once every three or four weeks in the winter time I mean that's how rare and it's not in the best light that so it's not really growing that well it's on an east window they do like a little brighter light if you can give it to them um, but succulents are just trial and error find those that work well for you and then just go with those there's so many and there's usually succulents that have twins that look like cactus or something that you can get so that you can have what you like, the look. Or you can trade, trade with your friends. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. There's lots of different kinds but out the, there. But it's, it's some, and some houses just don't like certain plants. So try a different plant and they stay within the mm -hmm. succulents and keep trying is all I can say. But they're just, they're fun. I like succulents, they're easy. You usually don't have to do much to them, but good, good drainage. Excellent. And succulents are very popular. They so are, and they're easy, really, Yeah, most of the time. She's okay. <laughs> we pull them out of a floral design and then root them. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, or they're rooted from a floral design. It's really nice. Yeah. Thank you, Teresa. And then next is Dr. Jim Appleby. Hi, Jim. Hi. I'm an entomologist at the University of Illinois, so I deal with the insects and mites attacking trees, shrubs, and flowers. Now, Diane, uh, a couple weeks ago, you had a fellow call in, and he wanted to know the name of that beautiful yellow plant that mm -hmm. he sees all over the fields. And this plant is called butter weed. Just like what you put on your toast, butter. It's a beautiful yellow color called butter weed. So I think that's what he had. He also had a caller 
uh, concerning, he was concerned about the uh, spots on his buckeye tree or horse chestnut. Here we see the one that's it's sort of yellow in color, a little spot, and that's a rust disease. And then these brown spots is anthracnose. So these plants do get several different uh, diseases, all caused by fungi, but there's really nothing you can do about that. So, And uh, it doesn't kill it, it's just... It doesn't kill it, no. A little bit unsightly. Yeah. Good. Well, um, I was so glad that he had followed up from a couple questions on the show from other weeks, so that's really great. We do want to give a, a shout out to one of our former panelists, a great panelist on Mid-American Gardener, Judy Fair, because it is her birthday. So happy birthday to Judy, and we always enjoyed having her on the show. Well, now we're going to go to a video email and see what the question is for the panel. So this is another one of my pear trees, and it has these um, little branches growing up straight up, like that one right there. And I'm wondering if it's okay to trim it at this time of year when it's just got the blossoms, or whether I should wait until another time of year to prune or trim my, my fruit trees, my pear tree. Thank you. Okay, so a pear tree and pruning. You want to start off, Bob? Yeah, so the, the pear tree is interesting. I don't know what you have there exactly, but it's a, a normal pear tree you grow. Pears grow, grow in kind of funny plants. They grow really up in a big elliptical form. Apple mm -hmm. trees are kind of round. These are like this. And it turns out that when they're growing like that, the, the fruit that flowers first are the branches that are kind of bent out like this. The ones, if you want to get a flower, if you get your branches to bend out like that, they'll flower sooner. And so what you might, might want to think about on these trees, I don't know how old your trees are or what you're trying to do there, but you might want to take some of these baby branches and kind of bend them over and make them grow more flat and they, they're more likely to flower. Now also in terms of pruning, the best time to prune a tree is really let, the, let that wood harden off and take and prune it during the winter time. And I, I'm, I'm kind of afraid that it might have a problem if you start cutting it off there right now, the succulent growth, you're going to have more succulent growth come on is what I, I would guess. And Jim about... I totally agree because a lot of the boars that attack trees emerge during the month of June and July. So this would not be the good time to prune. Okay, so I more like like grapes? Would it be February, March or March, yeah, April? Probably yes, right, right. Yeah, sometimes with that new succulent, when you injure the new succulent growth, then that makes a nice site for other for, okay. for critters to get in there and take a bite and start spreading diseases and, and their saliva or whatever. Very good. Well, we do like the video emails because we can see the plants. So if you have a, a challenge or an opportunity, you might want to do a, a video and send it to us, to us as well. All right, let's go to the phone lines and we're going to start first with uh, line five uh, about an oak tree. Hi there. Line five. All right, I don't hear anything. So let's go to line two, and this is about an ornamental pear tree. Is there someone there on line yes. two? Hello. Hi. I have an ornamental pear tree, and the leaves are kind of a light yellow with, and then light green instead of being the dark green. And it, but the branches are real healthy on it. There's nothing on them that looks diseased, but some of the leaves are turning brown on the edges and curling up. But the rest of the tree, the tree looks healthy, but it, there aren't very many leaves on it like they're usually, you know, like they're usually real full and real dark green. You know, we did get a cold spell. I don't know if that would cause it. Or, or are there any insect issues with the ornamental pears? I don't pears? think the insect, but, uh, you know, it could be an anthrax. No, That's so, what I was thinking. Uh, um, you know, to verify that, I think I would plant, uh, send that to the plant clinic, a specimen to our cl plant clinic. Mm -hmm. And if we have the screen for the plant clinic, that'll give you an idea of, of uh, where to send it or where to go to take it. So anthracnose. Which likes the cool yeah. nights mm -hmm. with these bright sunny days and mm -hmm. this cool rainy period we've had. Right. So the cold snap is, really it's elongated. It just adds and, to and it. When it's cold, term. nitrogen doesn't come up right. as easy either yeah. in the plants. Yeah. So the yellowing could be from the nitrogen and the cold weather too, because I've yeah. noticed that on some other plants around, yeah. some and of the roses. And the soils are really wet too. So yeah, yes. so they're cooler <coughs> than they should be. So mm -hmm. it could just be the weather condition. If you ride it out for the next couple of weeks, it may ride itself. Very good. That was a good question. Thank you so much. All right, now let's go to line four 
and we are going to talk about a plant that looks like a strawberry. Hi there, line four. Hi. Um, I have a question about uh, in, in my yard, uh, along the fence and, and throughout the, the yard, we have a plant that looks like a strawberry. They, they will spread out like strawberries. They mm -hmm. send shoots everywhere. And uh, it has yellow flowers and have a, like a miniature strawberry. Question one is, is this edible? Is these little strawberries that have grandkids sometimes they come in? Uh -huh. They think they're strawberries. And, and I know they're in the same family, I'm sure. Right. Now, but, now what, what you're looking at, the, the plant you have is called potentilla. The P-O-T, some people say potentia, potentilla, and they have five, five leaflets is what that means. And you describe it exactly. They, have, they look like a strawberry. It has yellow flowers. And, the, and then the, the little fl the flowers, they set fruit, and the fruit set swells up, looks like a little wild strawberry. Nice red color, looks just like a strawberry. But when you take a bite, I was like taking a bite of cotton because there's nothing there. And they're real close related. They, they produce runners like strawberries. In some cases, they actually have resistance to the same herbicides as if you take and spray them <coughs> with spray the strawberry field. Those guys will survive with the strawberries. They're so closely related. And, but they're actually a different, a different genus. And there's, a, there's one type of it that uh, they use is a woody plant. Mm -hmm. it, it, it put in the field is a type of potent, potentilla. And it will also, you can be, it actually can hybridize with strawberries. It gives some resistance to strawberries. But it's not a strawberry, and that's certainly not good to eat. But it's a really surprise you go out and pick wild strawberries, and it's there. Now, I've had them in my yard. They're very hard to get rid of. <laughs> If it's a problem, they're kind of pretty little plants if you just want to head, let, let them take over your yard. But you have to get out there and pull out the runners and then the, uh, try to get all the fruits off because the seeds germinate pretty readily and they spread. And then with the runners, they really go. But it's, it's not a strawberry. It's not poisonous, but it not, doesn't taste good. So it's, I was yeah. thinking, too, I do have wild strawberries in my yard, but, you know, flower is white. Mm -hmm. It's right. not yellow. And, oh, it's <coughs> the most seeds in the smallest area that you can, mm -hmm. I mean, it. It does, some of them taste okay, but. Yeah. Well, but strawberry is the only fruit that has its seeds on the outside. Aha. Uh -huh. oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. We can. That, that may be can, giving away our quiz later on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it might be, it may not though. All right, well, now let's do cut to our, um, our little quiz and see if that's what it's about. It's about strawberries. Let's see what our quiz is about. You're good, Teresa. That's good. You, you won that one. It was only partial of the, the answer, though, so that's... I didn't know how many. I didn't count them. So. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, some of them, when I was in grad school, it produced some of the... We had a couple of grad students who were actually doing that for their thesis. They were counting, and some of them had six or 700. Really? And the, and the more of those little seeds, they're actually fruits that are on there, the bigger the fruit gets. And some of those giant, you see those things yes. in California, they're like this. Mm -hmm. And you, if you count those, there are hundreds of individual fruits on that. that wow. Yeah. But counting them, oh, that'd be exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go to some um, emails now. And so, Bob, if you want to okay. have another uh, question for us. Yes, uh, <coughs> let's see, Elaine Treber uh, ph ph phoned in or wrote in or whatever she did here and had a couple questions on the to tomatoes and blueberries. And I'm not a tomato guy. So I, I can recognize a tomato, but I don't know anything about them. And so, but there's a question about blueberries, and I can talk about blueberries. And the, uh, qu the question is, I have been trying to grow blueberries in my backyard in Palace Heights, Illinois, but have not had much luck. Do you know why this might be? Well, there's a couple of things about blueberries. The most important thing about blueberries is they have to have acid soil. They absolutely have to have acid soil. I always tell my students the three most important factors in growing blueberries is pH, pH, and pH. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you have to adjust the soil. Now, what you have to do before you, before you plant blueberries, is you take and dig, dig a, you ought to take and get your soil adjusted, but if you don't do that, you ought to at least dig a big hole, get some sphagnum peat moss, and put, put half soil, half sphagnum peat moss. Sphagnum is very acid, that'll help with that. You may have to add some sulfur based on your pH results, and the sulfur makes sulfuric acid, makes the soil more acid. 
and then you take and plant your blueberries. When you plant your blueberries, never fertilize. You'll see in some of the books it says fertilize right. Don't fertilize your blueberries. You fertilize them, you'll kill them. Don't fertilize. Wait about six weeks after you plant it. Then you take and fertilize with ammonium nitrate. You give them a little uh, fertilizer, and they'll start to grow. Now, the next big trick is they have to have acid soil. They like lots of sun. The next big, big, big problem with blueberries is they have to have acid soil. And so in order to maintain the acidity, if you go to the garden center, then what they want to sell you is alumin aluminum sulfate. And that's what you use for your hydrangeas, you use for your rhododendrons to get the soil acid. The aluminum will kill your blueberries. They will not tolerate it. So what you use is ammonium sulfate to fertilize, to, is a fertilizer to maintain the pH of the soil. The ammonium is ideal for the blueberries. It, you have to fertilize it that <coughs> every year. You have to fertilize it, and it, occasionally you might want to do that. The other thing the blueberries really like is mulch, and uh, any kind of leaf mulch or straw mulch or sawdust mulch around the blueberries, maybe six or eight inch, inches deep all around the, the plant, right up to the trunk. A lot of plants may say never, never do that because it makes the trunk. Blueberries love it. Put it right up to the trunk. Lots of mulch. They really like mulch because you got to fertilize them. <coughs> you got to adjust and maintain the pH. And ideally, they, the more sun they have, the happier they'll be. So a sun, sunny spot, I mean, you have to adjust the pH. You just have to give them those things, and then they are great. Yeah. <laughs> they do appreciate it. Well, good. Thank you for that question. And now we're going to go to you, Teresa. Well, I have a lady, Janet, here, is asking about uh, native plants to use and where to get them. And Native plants um, at our local nurseries, there's usually a few but never a big selection. That's just the na nature of the beast. Um, but if you get a hold of places like the Missouri or Chicago Botanic Gardens, they do native plantings and they have ideas and they can give you direction and help you find the plants you're looking for. Um, the Red Bison Group here does a plant sale every year, but I think it's already happened this year for this season. Mm -hmm. So it, we only have maybe one or two a year here and it's, they're, they're difficult. A lot of times it's because they're hard to germinate and hard to get going and they're slow to grow. Doesn't mean they're a bad plant, it just takes more time. And there are places that you can get them, but places that have native prairie plants already established can give you that information and give you those links. So I would get a hold of like Chicago I think there, is, there are some nurseries that specialize in, yes. in native yeah. plants too. But they, they, can do they, they can help you contact that. Right. Yeah, they can get you the list right. that you could get you to the right place. And boy, they're worth it once you get them mm -hmm. started. Oh yeah. Okay, thank you. And now on to some show and tell with Jim. Yes, Di uh, Dan, you had uh, many calls about the uh, condition on oak that the leaf edges were browning. Well, this is oak anthracnose. So it's very common this year because of our very cold, wet spring. There's really nothing you can do about that. And then you had a question from a lady. She said that she had these yellowish green insects feeding on her undersides of her oak foliage and that they were chewing off the foliage. Um, if we can go to the first photograph, uh, I think what she has is aphids that's feeding on the on the oak, and uh, the uh, mouth parts of aphids are sucking piercing, so they can't chew anything. The leaves are that she has, I'm sure, is caused by what we call a condition called leaf tatters. If we go to the second photograph, this shows what the uh, leaf probably looks like. Uh, you see, there's hardly any. Uh, intervenal tissues. You just have these little spindly um, leaves and this is a condition we call leaf tatters. If we go to the next photograph it shows a silhouette of the uh, foliage and you can see again you just have almost the main veins and this is called leaf tatters. Now we have a publication on leaf tatters and we found out that um, we did actually a study quite a few years at the University of Illinois and we found that it was herbicide drift, particularly from agricultural fields that was causing this condition on oaks, particularly the white oaks. And so if you, that lady would call that number 333-2770, we'll send you this publication on leaf tatters. And I think you'd, uh, it gives you all the information about that and how it's causing injury to oaks. 
You also find leaf tatters on hackberry as well. And we also have a publication on the emerald ash borer. I've had several questions concerning emerald ash borer. Again, if you call that number, 217-333-2770, uh, they would give you the information how you can obtain this leaflet on ash borer. Very good. Emerald ash borer. My oak looks the best ever because it was a late planting season. And yes. Wow, it mm -hmm. was really good. Well, thank you so much for your questions that you've sent in. And now we're going to go to the phone lines. First, line two about lilacs. Hi there. Hi. Uh, my lilacs have bloomed already for this year, mm -hmm. and I'd like to cut them down. I am completely intimidated by how much I can prune them because once a number of years ago I did, a, did something wrong and didn't have flowers the next spring. So I'm, I'm wondering, can I cut them down in size? Um, how much can I cut them down in size, and can you give me a guideline so I still have flowers next year? Lilacs aren't that hard, really. A big thing you want to do is wait till they're done blooming in the spring here, and they should be finishing up shortly here. I know mine's full going now, but it's a rule of thirds. If your mm -hmm. lilac wants a nice round ball, you want to take one-third of the oldest wood out clear to the ground. Oh. And just... So it may only be two, three branches that you take out. But once you remove those, then you can come back in and kind of round and shape and pull some of that lower growth down. And what you're wanting is that new growth coming up from the roots then for the next year. And over the course of three to five years, keep removing some of that oldest wood and get it rejuvenated down and keep the size back to what you want. And it shouldn't be too hard. And you shouldn't lose too much of the flowering then because you're going to have a lot of new energy popping up. Right. That's what we do blueberries also. Mm -hmm. It's the case you take out, mm -hmm. you have like six shoots, you take out the six-year-old and leave a new one and leave the five, four, and three, and every year you take out the oldest one and replace it. It's, it renews the whole plant. It's a but just wait till you're done blooming. Enjoy the blooms now. Do it soon here this summer. That's one you can do this summer. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and prune it now. Like now. Mm -hmm. yeah, blue, blueberry winter time. Don't do it yeah, in the summer. Don't do that. I do trim off the faded flowers too, mm -hmm. but um, but once you cut off the one third, there's just a few more to cut. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good, and the plant doesn't go into shock. I think anytime you do the shrubs that way, it's really good. All right. Well, we're going to go to line three, and it's a potted plant question. Hello. Hello. Uh, this is Mary from Jasper, Illinois, and I'm a farm girl that's moved in town, and I live in an apartment building. And I have a lot of flowers in pots uh, around my apartment. And um, I have trouble, last year it was terrible, the squirrels want to come in and dig the plants out of the pot. Mm -hmm. That's There's nice you'd feed I the squirrels, yeah. Squirrels out. <laughs> <laughs> it was a dry year, and they will definitely do that. They ate my tomatoes mm -hmm. one bite and left it set. Yes. <laughs> um, outside of caging, there's hard, it's, it's difficult to keep the squirrels out because even if you put water or another food source out, your plants are still more tender, more succulent, and they want those. Um, I don't know a good solution. Nothing I've tried lasts and works long term. I know they were getting some of my plants and I found ways to hang them, but then they do acrobatics. Yeah, yeah so squirrels, if, they, if they're saved. hungry enough, they're going to find a mm -hmm. way. And outside of a cage around it, that's about it. And then maybe grow some a vine up around it. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's kind of tricky. So if people have uh, ideas for us, let us know. I think that'd be fun to hear. Well, we're going to do a quick question about radishes, and this is on line six. Hello. Hello. Uh, yes, I cannot seem to grow radishes that well. My grandfather used to say, plant the, <clears throat> the below the ground vegetables in the dark of the moon and the above the ground in the light of the moon. I'm beginning to wonder if he wasn't right. I planted some white radishes earlier this <clears throat> year. They came up, but no radishes, just all top. So what am I doing wrong? Well, I know it got really, you know, it was really warm quick after we were able to work the soil. Um, I really don't know much about any of the... I don't either. But I go by when it's season. And I had great radishes because I planted them in March. It was cool. I didn't look at what time of the moon it was. I just planted them. <laughs> And they were able to come up. So, but when they get hot, they will not form the underground. They'll try to, to flower. Now, I always leave one of mine uh, flower and to see what it does because the birds like it. But you know, but otherwise, I think it's more cool driven. Mm -hmm. 
So just make sure, and it's a little too late now, but you can plant them in the fall then for a fall harvest. So you might check that out. Okay, well, we're gonna go to a quick little quiz, so stay tuned. We're learning so much. Well, thank you so much for watching. It really goes fast. We've had great questions today, and I, I just really enjoy hearing all of your input. Thank you for being here, and we hope that you will have a great week gardening. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.